this would be, but, you know, the issue of doctrine is on my mind right now. And, um, and I was happening, you know, sometimes you go back and actually I ran across the old teaching that we did, actually in 1993. And the book kind of jumped out at me. And um, I was thinking along that line, I didn't expect to see the book, but once I looked through it, I said, you know what, we need to go back and look at some of these things again. And um, one thing I like about keeping notes, this is one reason why I really encourage you, um, not just to hear, but to put to pen. You know, some people journal, you know, some people make, you know, um, they make notes of what they feel like God is speaking to them. But you know, when you go back over time, you can see where you came from. And, um, and then too, also, you can also find that, you know, how consistent you've been or if you've fallen back or, or anything like that as well in your own individual life. One thing I get from going back and looking over things that we've gone over in the past is consistent, you know. And that's all I want to be is consistent. Amen. In my walk and what I believe. Amen. And for the lack of not being strong in doctrine, a lot of people today are just falling away from the faith. But it's an issue of our foundations being right. A building is no stronger than its foundation. So if you go to Hebrews chapter 6, amen, you know, we need to, amen, what are the doctrines of Christ? What is it that he taught? Amen, because what he taught should be what we still teach. Now, if we don't master what the Bible calls foundations, how strong will our house be? You know, maybe one of the reasons why we, um, by the way, I say this, that, um, I'm going to share from a book tonight, and it's one that we actually got in uh, right around the time. We hit a, a citywide revival in 92, and um, we purchased materials that we began to share with our church from Mount Zion Christian uh, Church in Fayetteville. And um, one of them, the books was one called Sound Doctrine. One was False Doctrine. Most of y'all won't hear then, amen, but um, they were good, amen. So I'm going to use that kind of as a guideline, so I'm not going to take credit for what we're teaching. I always like to give it where it's due. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give you praise for your word tonight. God, establish us. God, the things that we know and are familiar with, strengthen us in it. The things that we don't know, Lord, build in us a foundation. God, we entrust ourselves now to you and to your word. And for it, God, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Actually, before I ran across it, I was actually thinking about principles of Bible study. Because that's something that's always near and dear to my heart because so often in the church, you know, we, when it comes to the issue of what does the Bible say, people got opinions. And I'm not one that's big on our opinion unless our opinion is Scripture. But oftentimes people will read the Word and say, well, this is what I believe it said. Now, no, it's what it said. See, that's a huge area of growth individually in people's lives, and it's hard to get people off that bubble. I found over the years in ministry, if you can get beyond what you think about Scripture and actually think about Scripture, what Scripture says about itself, you'll have no problem understanding the Bible. The mistake people make, I believe God is saying this. No, God said what he said. When it comes to interpreting Scripture, the Bible is his best interpretation. Now, we're going to see in 1 Corinthians 2 as well tonight that the Holy Spirit teaches by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Amen? Now, we can learn through our experiences, but experiences should never determine for us what God is saying. And that's one of the reason, reasons why the Church of Christ is so off base in the United States today. We are putting experience over doctrine. Amen? If we, and our experiences change. Amen? And so if what I believe is based on my experience, I got a shaky foundation for my faith. God wants us stable. Because what you believe, beloved, is going to be tested, and actually they're being tested more now than at any time probably in the history of the church. So we need to do what we can to make our calling and our election sure in Jesus' name. So tonight, we're going to call this sound doctrine. Amen. And I noticed looking back in the same book from um, now, I'm going to show you. This is why I say one thing that I like about me, and I ain't big-headed about it. Once I latch on to something, I ain't moving. First thing I pinned there was 1 Peter 3.15. In other words, back then, I was still teaching apologetics, and I'll continue to do so. 
Amen. Right then, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and have a reason for everyone that asks you of that hope that's in you. In other words, saints, the word of God is what builds that consistency in our lives, not our experience. Experiences change, don't they? If you're going to be a consistent believer, you've got to build on the right foundation then so that you won't change. I wrote another thing in the preface of the book. I am a fundamentalist. <laughs> Amen. Now, there, I don't know why I wrote that back then, but uh, maybe I was vocalizing that. But you are, if you believe fundamentally what the Bible says. If the Bible is what you believe, and you believe the basic doctrines in the scriptures, amen, you're a fundamentalist. Some people run from that tag because they think it's a bad word. You fundamentalists, you know, they got it equated with being narrow-minded, racist, homophobic, and a bigot. Amen. No, amen. I am narrow-minded because Jesus was narrow-minded. He said, I'm the way. Well, I believe he is the way. Amen. He said, there's a broad path that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to life everlasting. Yeah, I'm narrow-minded. In other words, I take it and make it a badge of honor. I ain't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. In other words, but the foundation is what determines how we stand. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to go to second, um, in a minute, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter um, 6. But before you go there, amen, I want you to write down 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. Paul saying to Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Therein is why we need to know the scriptures. They give us wisdom. Amen? Unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures. Somebody say all. All, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The reason is so that the man of God may be perfect. Now, the word perfect there is teleos. It means complete. God wants to bring us to a place of completion in him, but it's through us, amen, um, receiving the word of God. It's profitable, but it means it, it benefits us, doesn't it? So the word of God profits us in the areas of what we believe, but the word of God also corrects us, doesn't it? Amen. He said that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, doctrine generally we know to mean teaching, don't we? Reproof, amen, um, you know, or you could say reproof carries with it a similar thought as correction. Amen? Amen. To admonish one, to warn, amen, to reprove you. Amen. Or to tell a fault or to expose it. Amen. The Word of God is profitable, amen, for correction in it. Now, the correction part means that it makes the wrong right. It's the thought of bending something straight, amen. You know, when we're off, we're, straight, we're put back in, lamb, in a proper alignment by knowing what the Word of God says, amen? Hallelujah. And so the Word of God is profitable for all those areas, amen. It instructs us, tells us how we ought to live, what we ought to believe, what we need to forsake, what we need to let go, amen. The Bible tells us that. So if we give the Word preeminence in our lives, then we'll be okay, Amen. That's why I say if we put something above our opinion and our experience, then we can build on a sure foundation. Amen? And that's why always over the years and now going into the future, amen, my experiences will not dictate to me what I believe. That's why I say if I lay hands on the sick and they don't live, I still believe laying on a, it's, it's a doctrine Jesus taught. In other words, just because it didn't work every time you did it doesn't make it wrong. Amen? Amen. You know, the secret things belong to God. Amen. Like that old song said, we'll understand it better by and by. We won't get it all till we get to heaven. Amen. And so my experiences then don't, tick, don't dictate what I know to be true. The Bible does. Amen? Hallelujah. So we need to believe that all Scripture are divinely inspired. Amen. That they came from God. They were not just the writings of men. Amen. 2 Peter 1.20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's why I often say, hey, not my opinion, not my thought, not my experience. The Word is the best interpreter of itself. It's not of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. 
that literally means carried along by the Holy Ghost. Amen. In other words, they spoke as God led them to speak, even when what they penned made them look bad. <laughs> by the way, that's one of the internal evidences, evidences that the Word of God is true. If men were writing of themselves, generally make yourself look good. Amen? All Scripture, somebody say all Scripture. All Scripture, all scriptures then are divinely inspired, and since they are given through the Spirit of God, they can only be understood by revelation of the Spirit of God. Amen? Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I say 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Amen. But um, since they came from the Spirit of God, they can only be understood by those who have the Spirit of God. Amen? Now notice verse 9 here, the apostle says, But it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep, the deep things of God. Amen? Let's all read beginning in verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. Amen. Now, what is that telling us? Pastor, I can't understand the Bible. What is that telling us about the Word of God? Amen. All believers have the capacity to understand Scripture. Amen. 1 John 2 mentions that. He said, you know all things. If the one who knows all indwells us, amen, then he's able to teach and lead us. See, a lot of Christians believe, man, I can't understand the Bible. It's, it's too hard. And they'll say, well, you know, them these and thou's in the King James give me problems. Amen. It's not the these and thou's. You could take out the D's and thou's and replace them with modern English. That still don't give you revelation. Amen. Revelation comes by the Spirit of God. Let's keep reading. Which things also we speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What does that say about this individual, the natural man? He can't understand. Amen. Now, how often have we heard people say that, you know, concerning, you know, people that aren't born again, you know, well, they know the Bible better than I do. How many of y'all heard folks say that? No, they don't. If they understood truly what the Bible said, they fall on their face in repentance. Amen. Amen. If they really believe what they read and what they saw penned, they come to Jesus. Amen. See, natural knowledge, you can get a general natural knowledge of what the Bible says. Amen. But you don't get revelation except that come by the Spirit of God. Amen? He's the one that opens the Word of God up to us, yeah. Amen. And we actually have scripture for that. Jesus said, this people honor with me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Uh-huh. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit teaches those who are born of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, the Holy Spirit has a distinct ministry to those that don't know Jesus. Amen. John 16 says to convict them. <laughs> Amen. You know, he's out there trying to draw them. Amen. Convict them of sin. And Jesus said, and of righteousness because they believe not on me. But to us, the believer, he's our teacher, our guide. Amen. 
He's, a, he's the one who's called alongside the paracletes or kletos, amen. He's the one called, he strengthens us, doesn't he? In other words, he illuminates us in the word of God. He gives us understanding. He opens up the scriptures. So he has a different ministry among us than he does to the world. Amen? And so we need to be in Christ to receive of his scripture. Amen? Hallelujah. So God's given this to us. And so he says in the next verse, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. I thought you couldn't judge. <clears throat> well, anyway, moving on. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. You know, we could actually stay on those scriptures all night. Amen. See, God will open up his word to us if we believe it. Amen. And so that means that I can understand the word of God. Amen. I might not understand and catch everything as I read it, amen, but I'm storing it on the inside and the Holy Ghost can teach me, amen? So we need to read the Word, we need to study the Word, amen, we need to uh, learn to meditate on the Scriptures, amen, to think on them, amen, and God will open up the Word, amen, so God will open up and we'll have the mind of Christ when we begin to think like what He wrote, Amen? In other words, this is what we do. We're called to renew our minds, aren't we? Amen. And so we got to learn to receive God's word as if God's word is really true. Amen. That means you need to be saved. Amen. And once you're born again, you're in house. Everything else is outside. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, our salvation encompasses, we can kind of setting up an introduction here. Our salvation co covers um, three basic areas of our lives, amen. Spiritually, we were born in sin, weren't we? Amen. What happens when we are saved? We're made alive unto God, aren't we? Now, in John 3, 3, Jesus said you must be born again. Amen. Now, remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 describes us as a trinity. And he said, I pray to God of peace, sanctify you holy, spirit, soul, and body, preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord. Amen. Now, when we are born again, we're born again of the Spirit, right? Amen. And so I'm in Christ. Old things have passed away now. Behold, all things are become new. He went on to say, however, all things are of God. Amen. So he needs to be the object of our faith and our affection, doesn't he? Amen. So now that I'm born again of the Spirit, what about my mind, my soul? Remember James uh, what, it talked about us working out our salvation. Amen. Well, that, that doesn't mean we work to get saved, but we're renewing our mind so we can think like the Bible tells us. Amen. So we need to renew our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2 don't. Because even though I'm born of the Spirit, the way I think in my thoughts, you know, that's where that battle comes in between us, the old man, the new man. Amen. You know, uh, all of a sudden we're alive unto God in the Spirit, but the way we th think can hold us in bondage. That's why someone can be saved and still be held captive. So what do we do? We go to the Word of God. The Word of God are the thoughts of God. Amen? And as we begin to see how God thinks, then we should purpose in our man to think like him. But as we stay in the perfect law of liberty, the Bible says it changes us, doesn't it? And we begin to change to reflect the one that we're reading about, the one that we're spending time fellowshipping with. And he does that through. This is the perfect law of liberty right here, his word. The Bible calls it a mirror as well, doesn't it? So as we behold in a, as in a mirror the perfect law of liberty, it changes us, doesn't it? That's why Satan wants to cut us off from Scripture, amen? You know, that's why he said, well, you can't understand the Bible. Uh, you can't, you know, you need somebody to interpret it for you. Well, no, the Holy Spirit interprets, amen? Now, in a setting like this, we can discuss the Word of God. We can um, 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 build our faith in what the Bible says, but it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the revelation of it. How often have we read scriptures over and over and over and all of a sudden, man, I never saw that. In other words, he turned the light on. That's by revelation. Now that becomes a foundation in my life. You're not shaking me then. Amen. See, I know then in whom I believed. I know he's able to keep what I committed to him. Amen. Well, pastor, you sure you say too late. I'm convinced. Amen. How do I know? Because of the testimony of Scripture, not how I feel. See, once you get off the feelings and get your faith in the Word, 
That's why Jesus often pointed people to his scriptures. Have you not read in the scriptures? Amen. Our faith needs to be in God's word, not how we feel. So I don't get up and say, do I feel saved today? No, I take it for a fact I am. In other words, you know, once we give the word that place, he produces in us peace. Amen? Amen. So we need to renew our minds. Be born again, number one. Number two, we need to renew our minds so that then we can discipline this body, the flesh. Amen? And we do all that through the word of God. Now, the way we do that is getting established in first in the foundational things that the Bible tells us to. One of the reasons why, you know, there's so much... Um, you can go to Hebrews chapter 6 now. So much in, a, in the body of Christ today concerning, you know, what is um, marriage and what is male and what is this and what is that is because people moved away from the foundation of Scripture to experience. Amen? So doctrines then, well, if you were to look it up, you'll find this logos. It's the word. Amen. But when it says, going on from the doctrines of Christ, these are specific things that Jesus told. Amen? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, and let's read that aloud. Y'all wait for me. I'm late. Hebrews chapter 6. We need to learn these. Verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, stop right there. That's his communication. Logos there means his communication his words, amen, or these are foundational things that he taught. Notice he says, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Those are six foundational things that you can find Jesus taught. They taught more than that, but these are called the um, foundations here by Paul the Apostle. Amen? So doctrines here, logos, amen, the fundamental teachings, the basics of the Christian faith, we need to get rooted and grounded in this. Amen? And so we're going to look at how we build that root, how we get grounded tonight. Let me give another principle. We need to agree with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Somebody read that for us, please. This is one of the reasons why we're talking about these basic things he taught. We need to agree that it's true. Agree with God and one another. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Whoever gets it, go ahead and read it. This is one of the reasons why doctrines are so important. They, they produce in us unity. Amen. Notice he said that, that you speak the same thing. If we agree with what the Bible says, we ought to say in agreement among ourselves what it says. Amen. Well, this is what I believe. No, 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 no. This is what I think. No, what did he say? Amen. Why? He said that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same man. Amen. See, if we all believe the word of God, we wouldn't have all these offshoot beliefs about what I think the Bible says. This is what I believe the Bible says. No, we believe the same thing because the same Bible is telling us the same thing. So if, we're not, if, so if we take the word as truth and we believe the scriptures, there wouldn't be petty divisions among us in the church. Because most of the divisions are about what we believe. Amen? He said, join together in the same man and the same judgment. We make the same decisions based on what the Bible says. So it wouldn't be an issue about what is a marriage, what is a man, what is a woman. It wouldn't be an issue about how we got here because the Bible tells us. See, we'd have the same man and the same judgment if we all believed the same word. But people will take opinion and what somebody said and how they felt and and they'll put that above Scripture. Another reason why we need to do this is so that we can um, be in the unity of the faith. Notice Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 17, the whole purpose for the fivefold ministry. Amen. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
that speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is head, even Christ. Amen. In other words, you know, what does that is the word of God. Amen. The pastor needs to preach it. The evangelist needs to preach it. The prophets. We shouldn't be disagreeing. Not if we preach from the same scripture. Amen. Okay, so when you look at Hebrews 6, 2, a principle is a, um, a principle is something that doesn't change, isn't it? Amen. You know, um, so these are basic things that he's not going to change whether we like it or not. Amen. And basically there are six of them. Amen. Let's say them together. Repentance from dead works. And the faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So if you go back through the Gospels, you know you can actually find scriptures where Jesus, he preached all of those. Yeah. And, um, you know, you could even say, well, he preached casting out devils too. Amen. But, but that your eternity doesn't hinge on whether you cast out devils or not. But if you don't have, repent and have faith toward God, you don't get to be with Jesus. So these are essential. Uh, you know, these are what we call essentials. Amen. You know, in other words, we shouldn't be in disagreement about these. Because when it comes to the first two, amen, if I don't believe those two, I'm not getting in his kingdom. Amen. Then when it comes to baptisms, Amen. We don't have to agree on baptisms, you know, we ought to, but it's not an essential to your salvation. Amen. The only baptism that matters is whether you're baptized into Christ. And then you ought to be obedient to him and get the other baptisms. See, there are more than one baptism. Notice it's plural there, isn't it? And so we'll look at that. Amen. Jesus taught the laying on of hands. He did it. He commanded us to do it. And Jesus talked a lot about the resurrection of the dead. And he talked a lot about eternal judgment. You know, the guy we watched a little while ago that we played a video that was out there preaching about no hell and Carton Pearson, you know, he's going against one of the basic teachings of Jesus. That makes him a heretic and a false teacher. Amen. Just because his grandma wasn't saved when she died, he, could, he shouldn't have changed his theology based on her experience and his and in the pain of her loss. See, see, I can't do that. You know, you know, we shouldn't do that because whether somebody we love goes to heaven or hell, that shouldn't change what I believe because of what Jesus said. Amen? So experience should not affect what we believe from Scripture. But how often have we seen that? A lot of people, well, I don't know about that. You know, I don't know about that hell stuff. Well, it's out there. He warned you not to go. Now, if we resist the Holy Ghost and resist the witnesses coming to us, sharing the gospel with us, and, and we die outside of Christ, that's not Jesus' fault. The Holy Spirit is doing all that he can to draw you to him. Amen. And you have to continually resist and resist and resist and resist. But only if you choose to go that way, he won't force you. It won't be his fault. Amen. Hallelujah. But those are the basic doctrines that we find Jesus teaching. Amen. You know, matter of fact, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 14, 4, verse 17, it came out and said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. That's a consistent thing. Amen. He told the disciples to preach it. Amen. You know, faith toward God. Amen. Well, you don't get saved unless you have faith toward God, do you? Amen. You know, um, you got to believe what God said. Baptisms. Jesus, he got, he got baptized out of obedience in Matthew 3, didn't he? Amen. John prophesied and said that there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. I'm not worthy to latch his shoes, but he'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. Then come Jesus, baptize me, John. I need to be baptized to you. He says, suffer it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. See, once we are saved, we ought to be baptized in water. The word baptism is baptizo. It means to immerse. Now, if you get sprinkled, that doesn't affect your salvation. You just didn't follow through obedience. See, I wouldn't fall out of fellowship with someone over that, but if not baptized into Christ, they're not saved. Amen? 
By the way, that's 1 Corinthians 1, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Amen? So when we get born again, we're baptized into Christ. Amen? Mark 8, 23 to 25, Jesus laid hands on the sick, didn't he? Matter of fact, Mark 16, 18, he told us, lay hands on the sick and they would recover. So if you just do a, just a general look throughout scriptures, you'll find Jesus did everything that the Bible here tells us to do. The resurrection of the dead. Remember they came to Jesus and they were talking, well, this woman married all these different men. Who's going to be her husband in the resurrection? He said in the resurrection, there'll be his angels. Amen. You know, not marrying or giving in marriage. In other words, he talked about the resurrection on more than one occasion, didn't he? Matter of fact, in John eleven twenty five, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. And he said, whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he, yet shall he live. Amen. In other words, he is the resurrection, isn't he? Amen. But didn't he talk about eternal judgment quite often? Remember that scripture where Jesus was talking about, you know, be, where you'd be cast in hell, you know, it'd be better to enter into life having one eye or one foot than the whole body be cast into hell. Amen. Luke 16, verse 23, the rich man and Lazarus. You know, it says, and in hell, he lift up his ass. Jesus is telling the truth. That's not a parable. There is a hell. Amen. Now, Matthew 25, 41, God don't want anyone to go. It wasn't made for man. But if man sad with the one who first led rebellion against God, he go where they went. Amen. Now, Matthew 25, verse 41, he said, depart. And he's talking about the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, it's prepared for them. But if I don't repent and receive Jesus, men who don't receive Jesus and women, they go too. Amen? It's not God's desire that any of us perish, is it? No. And so he gave his son so that if we place our faith in him, turn from our wicked ways, believe that he will save us when we called on him, that we would never have to go to a devil's hell. But then when we leave, here, absent in the body, present with the Lord. Jesus taught those essentials throughout his ministry. Amen? And then we find the early church, they are consistent in preaching the same thing. Well, what's the problem with today's church? We want to put experience over Scripture because hell isn't a pleasant subject. But it's a true subject. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. And they were saved. Well, you know that as a, as, a, as a general rule, they baptized those who were saved. So he, even though it didn't say it, my assumption is that they were. Because just like when it came to the Ethiopian eunuch, he already understood baptism before he got saved. As soon as he got saved, you know, <laughs> yeah, he wanted to be baptized. Baptism didn't begin with John the Baptist. The teaching of baptism did not begin with John the Baptist. The Jews practiced baptism in the Old Testament, the, but the word wasn't called baptism. It was washings. The priest in their priestly duties. Amen. So even though it's not specifically said, we see other times when they were baptized, they were saved, and it was part of the doctrines of Christ. So we knew they did it. But the main thing is that we see they were baptized into Christ, weren't they? That's in Acts chapter 10. Yeah, in 11, Peter is defending their conversion. Uh-huh. 
So they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Wait a minute, they did get baptized. Verse 47. Uh uh, 10. Verse 45 says, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed, then they prayed him to tarry certain days. So they got baptized. Amen. Yeah, so they got baptized. Amen? So the doctrines of Christ and the six basic principles, I'm going to call them foundation stones, that we need to build our Christian faith on. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2.20 says, are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, I said earlier that no house is stronger than the foundation it's built on. Amen? Because if it's going to stand the storms, if it's going to stand the... Uh, adversity that comes, foundation needs to be right. So Christians are caving because our foundations aren't right. Amen. See, what we get is a lot of teaching on how to do this, how to be that, how to do that. But the basis of what we need to stand on, amen, isn't taught that much. Repentance from dead works. If you don't repent, Jesus said you'll perish. Amen. You need faith toward God to get saved. You need to be baptized into Christ, don't you? Amen? And the way we lay these foundations is by teaching them. So an element of our preaching and teaching should always theme somehow around repentance. And we'll squeeze that into pretty much every message. You know, the gospel is going to come out. <laughs> Amen. You know, you need to repent if you really want to be saved. Amen? In Acts 2.38, 2, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. But what was their doctrine? What Jesus told. Amen? and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and of prayers. Amen. So we lay the foundations by teaching the Word of God. Amen. And not compromising on those foundations for the sake of unity and getting along with people, or to be accepted. Amen. See, some things are non-compromisable. Amen. If you don't repent, you will not be saved. Amen. You cannot be saved unless you repent. So that means then you can't add Jesus to your lifestyle. See, that's the whole controversy of what they call gay Christian. See, that's why I say if the foundation is laid, you say, wait a minute, I love you, but if you're not willing to leave what you're doing, you can't be saved. See, it's so simple. Why is the church compromising that? Because we hadn't laid the foundation. We hadn't gotten established in the foundation. We don't have a revelation that, hey, if you don't repent, amen, by the way, that seems to be the only lifestyle that wants Jesus to accept them as they are and still stay like they are. And you don't see Christian adulterers running around, not by title. Amen. Now, Christians might fall into adultery, but they don't say, man, I, I come to Jesus, but I'm going to keep right on practicing. No. Only with that lifestyle, isn't it? Amen. In other words, there's no repentance there. Amen. I can't add Jesus to my lifestyle and expect him to receive me. Amen. See, I've got to have a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That happens when I get a revelation of just how bad I really am. Amen. <laughs> when, I, when I recognize I'm not all that, that I come short. You know, my goodness is inadequate for me to get right with God. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us to recognize that in us. And we have a godly sorrow that work at repentance. Amen. Now, Judas repented, but he didn't repent to the Lord. He repented himself, the Bible says. See, that's like getting sorry because you got caught. See, there's a difference. A lot of people get sorry when they get caught, hand in the cookie jar. Got caught coming out the motel room. I'm sorry. No, if you were sorry, you went and went in that motel room. Amen. In other words, after the fact, oftentimes people say they're sorry. Now, the world frame it like this. They try and soften it up. You got to look contrite. They talk about that to politicians. You got to look like you're sorry. That's what they're saying. That don't mean you're sorry. 
Amen. You hadn't really repented until you're really sorry for what you've done. And you recognize the offended person may be a human, may be a loved one, but all me that you offended God. What did David say in Psalm 51? Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. In other words, when we recognize our lifestyle offends God and we turn to God and call on him, wanting to be changed, he saves us. And that's why a lot of people get what we call false conversion. Because they weren't really sorry for their sin, they might have been sorry that they were exposed. Amen? It's godless sorrow that work at repentance. And that not to be repented of, the apostles said, yeah. Mm. Right. He went to the wrong, wrong way. He went to them and said, I have offended a good man. But the Bible uses the term concerning him, he repented himself. You know, repentance is toward God. Amen. Hmm? Right, and he could have prayed that. And he knew what Jesus taught, but he didn't. And so he didn't receive, and he got his reward, unfortunately. Amen? You might want to write down Matthew 7, verse 27 and 28. These are foundation stone scriptures in my life. Amen? Because they tell me something. Because if our foundation in sound, building is going to fall under pressure, and we are under pressure in the church of Christ today. Amen? He says, therefore, whosoever hear these sayings of man and do it them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house. It's coming. And, and it fell not. Why? For it was founded on a rock. He dug down. He got the foundation right. But he said, Everyone that heareth these sayings of man and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. In other words, those that build on the right foundation and those that don't are going to experience the storms, the wind, and the rains. Amen. Whether you stand depends on your, founda your foundation, don't it? So we need to dig deep to make sure our foundation is sure. The Bible tells us to make our calling and our election sure. Amen. And so we need to make sure that we get these things right. So let's look real briefly at this. Amen. A little bit more. Repentance from dead works. Repent means to do what? To turn. The word for repentance is meta noah. It means, oh, you turn from one direction and you go in another, don't it? Huh? You do a 180. Amen. In other words, it's not, it's not just turn over a new leaf. I'm turning my life away from the direction it's been going, and I'm turning to the one who promised to save me when I did that. Amen. In other words, sometimes when people repent, they actually have to turn away from man-made laws and traditions. I did. You know, I thought for years that because I joined the church, I was saved. You know, well, I found out that the church didn't save me. I had my name on a roll, but I wasn't born again. Amen? But I was a member of church. Somebody said, I'm a member in good standing. Amen. You know, you know but, but are you saved? Amen. See, those are dead works, aren't they? If I want to be made a member of the church by letter or Christian experience, if I didn't get the experience but I had the letter, <laughs> that didn't get me right with God, did it? Amen. And so our name was on a roll. That was a lot of us, wasn't it? Amen. But we weren't in heaven on his roll. Our name wasn't in the book, the one that counted. Amen. So we needed to have a change of mind. That's another uh, thought for the word repentance. You have a change of mind about how you're living, what you're doing, and where you're going. And you purpose to turn from that with God's help. Yeah. Uh-huh. Amen. And through the church. And that's such a, it's a danger. 
Because even today when you witness to certain people say, I belong to such and such a church, they still trust in their church to save them. And so that's traditional men that make the word of God of no effect. So we need to not preach tradition. We need to preach the word, don't we? Amen. Even to this day, some are still more interested in people joining the church than they are them being born again. I was listening to a worship teacher today saying that he happened to be at a, a worship conference and he was talking to some musicians and he found out one of the musicians had been playing in a church for six years and nobody ever shared the gospel with him. He said they were interested in his gifts, but they weren't interested in his soul. Oh yeah, that happens in a lot of our churches too, doesn't it? See, if they've got a natural gift, sometimes we can use them because they can't worship God if they don't know God. If we're honest, <laughs> most Christians don't know the difference between the anointing because somebody can play good and not know the Lord. They ain't anointed. His spirit didn't sanction that. Uh-oh. That's talent. And see, we can respond to talent, can't we? But we need to be concerned with a person's soul. Amen. See, whenever we take someone in because of their talent and we put them in position, we told them they're okay like they are. That makes it harder to witness to that person later. That's why it's so hard to witness to a lot of musicians that are playing in churches that aren't saved. I'm playing for the Lord. No, you're playing for claps. I mean, if we're honest about it. But they've been deceived by the church. Mm-hmm. There you go. See, it's a de deception. Amen. And who deceived them? The church. Our repentance must be toward God. Our, our talent can't get us in. But we've given people that impression we need to repent. Not talking about us, but, you know, a lot of churches need to repent of that. Amen? Um, you know, so, why? Because otherwise they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Now, 1 Timothy 3.15 says turn away from that. Amen? 2 Timothy, rather. So dead works. Amen? Anything that don't glorify God. Man-made rights, customs, beliefs. Amen? He said repentance from dead works. Amen? Um, good works, amen. A lot of people do a lot of good work. One of the deceptions in the body of Christ now is social justice, where people think if they go out and they do all these works, feeding the poor and all of this, that's what we're called to do. Now, at some point, we're going to do a teaching on benevolence because the church got it all mixed up. Because if I go out and feed them and they never get to go Jesus, no Jesus, all I did was fed them up to go to hell. See, nothing takes place of the gospel. Oh, yeah, we get it all the time. <laughs> that is so true. And they will get bent out of shape. But when you look at benevolence in the New Testament, it was among the believers for the believers. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think I hear hard on that. Is the person in that illustration you're talking about, are they saved? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
but you gave your life to the Lord. So, you know, if you're reading your word, you're studying, and you're not in church, being in the church doesn't save you. This is for fellowship, discipleship, for mutual strengthening and encouragement, amen, for doctrine and teaching, amen. But we should go to church as believers, amen. So I don't have to be in church to get saved, but after I get saved, I need to get planted in a church, amen. That's the pattern, amen. And so then those that are planted in the house of the Lord, amen. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, he sets them in the body as it pleases him. Hebrews 10, 35, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. So there is a lot of people now that say because they're saved, they don't need to go to church. That's rampant in our youth today. You know, well, you know, because I can, I, you know, I can get what I need, you know, by streaming it and that. No, 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 you can't get through streaming what God designed you get through, you know, rubbing shoulders and fellowship. Amen. You know, there's something, you don't learn how to interact with people just by hearing the word of God on an app. We still need one another. We still need to rub shoulders together. Amen. Uh-huh. Sir? Yeah, we're to help you to learn. Amen. But, you know, the Holy Spirit teaches, you know. So even though we're teaching the Word of God, it's the Spirit of God that gives you the understanding. Sometimes we could be teaching one thing, the Holy Spirit can take what we're talking and show you something entirely different. Lead you in another direction, you go, praise God. But he brings you back. It all lands with his word. We measure the word with the word, which means we need to be students of God's word. Amen? But dead works will keep us out. That's one reason for all the substitutes we see out there today, to pull people away. They're dead works. They produce feelings and experiences, but they don't get them to Jesus. Amen? The whole thing about inclusionism, dead works. Amen? You know, whether it's Mormonism, Masonry, Masonry, it could be Islam, all it, dead works. Amen. Why? Because it doesn't lead to Christ. It actually leads people away. Catholicism, dead work. Amen. All those rituals, dead works. Amen. Good works don't get us to heaven. Amen? Hmm. Amen. Now, you know, it's who we turn to in repentance that gets us there. Amen? Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen? It's the new birth in it. Repentance from dead works. Amen? Then faith toward God. Amen? You know, what we said faith toward God would be? Hmm? Well, you pray, yeah, if you, you, you have to have faith in him and call on him, which requires, you know, that you believe in him. Repentance from dead works and the faith toward God. Believe in what he says concerning what you do in order to get right. You need to be willing to turn in repentance. Whosoever shall call, Romans 10, 13, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But beginning in Romans 10, 8, what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. See, that's faith toward God, isn't it? That I believe when I turn in faith, calling on Jesus to save me, a sinner, amen, he saves me. Amen. So our faith has to be in the right person in order to get born again. Can't be in my works. Can't be in my church. Can't be in my ritual. Can't be in how I was brought up. You know, it needs to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? For with the heart man believe it unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So a lot of people have their faith in the wrong thing to save them. They think their works will. Amen. Some think that jihad will save them. No, no, no. You need to come to Jesus. Amen? You know, so faith toward God. Amen. So even though we're looking at repentance from dead works, we need faith toward God. Amen. I'm kind of looking at those two together. 
because otherwise we don't get born again. Amen? Jesus redeemed us, didn't he? He paid the price for our sins, didn't he? Weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. Amen? Hallelujah. So, you know, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. And so I turn to him and I call on him. Got a question. How do we receive repentance from dead works? It's key. Go to John 16. The ministry of the Holy Spirit to the unbeliever. Verse 7, the Lord said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. He will reprove the world. That means convince, convict. He will reprove the world of sin. This is his ministry to the unsaved. He will reprove the world of sin, the Holy Spirit, and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Why? Because they believe not on me. So the Holy Spirit is drawing them. He's trying to, you know, work in trying to bring circumstances together, trying to get them to hear the word of God, convicting them even if they hadn't, you know, they, that they get a hunger in them to seek after God. But he's trying to get them to a place where they can receive Jesus. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He's working to try and draw them to Jesus. But one of the ways that causes them to be drawn is when they hear the word that we preach. Amen? See, they might have um, a desire to, they know that there's something more to life than what they're experiencing. You know, and in that hunger, they begin to seek after, you know. They don't know what they're looking for. And so what do people try looking for peace? Yeah, some of us try. Things of the world, amen. Some try alcohol. Some try, you know, relationships. You know, <laughs> things we did to our bodies, amen. Things we ingested. You know, th things that people did, you know, you know. They're seeking through high to get to a place of peace. Well, that's an evidence that they're seeking for something. Amen. But they don't know what. Who provides the, what points them in the right direction? It ought to be us. The fact that they're looking for what they can't get is an evidence that God is trying to draw them. But if somebody else comes along with a false belief system, they can reel them in too. And they can take that same measure of faith and believe in a false religion. But if we'll go and we'll share with them the gospel, I know what you're looking for. And you won't find it in a bottle. It's not in a rock. It's not in all those relationships you're in and out of. You know, it's not in any of that stuff you're trying. It's not in money. You know, what you need is peace with God. It only comes when your life is brought into right order through you repenting and receiving Jesus as your Savior. Somebody's got to preach the word to them. Amen. In other words, that's our job, isn't it? So we need to settle the issue. We believe they're looking. They're looking for all, well, old songs are looking for love in all the wrong places. But God already so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so they're out seeking what they can't find, and they try it, and they're not satisfied, and some just discourage and give up on life. But we have the answer in Jesus, though. So if we'll get out and we'll let them know, hey, what you're looking for is in him. The life you seek is in Christ. Amen. You know, if you trust him and you turn, even if you don't really know, just call, Lord, if you're really real. You know, you hear people, they say, Lord, I just cried out, Lord, if you're really real, do something with my life. And he intervened and they got saved. Amen. In other words, you know, he's seeking to draw them. But they receive false things because oftentimes some, we're not bold enough to speak out for Jesus. Amen. And we'll see them leave what looks like an outward life of sin and let all that other stuff go 
become a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Muslim? When had we shared the truth, they just as easily could have been a disciple of Jesus. Amen? We just pray that the Lord open a door. You know, um, it's hard when people are self-deceived. And see, that's the danger of false religion. You know, you get self-deceived because if any is a hearer of the word and not a doer, James talked about them, you get deceived. And, and you can be deceived into believing what you have is really true. But God can open a door. And that's what we we'll believe for, that he open a door for a witness. Amen. And um, mm, that's the clock again. Okay, repentance from dead works. To receive it, you become dissatisfied with your life. You remember how you got before you got saved? Man, I ain't got nowhere else to go. You know, I had to come to a place of recognizing that because I didn't do a lot of stuff that people call bad, I still wasn't good enough. Because could nobody say that I drank? Could nobody say that I smoked? To nobody say that they ever, you know, but I recognize that, wait a minute, I'm still a sinner. I'm still going to hell. It took the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen. Gwellin used to come to me, he said, he said, you need to get right with God. I said, I'm all right. Don't drink, don't smoke, hope old, help old women cross the street. In other words, I thought I was okay. I was religious outwardly in a sense, but not converted. Amen. There's a world of people out there that don't know Jesus. Their lives look like they're okay. Amen? And they might think that because they belong to an organization, they're right. We need to share the gospel with them, don't it? Amen? We need to pray and ask God to give us repentant hearts. Amen? Pray for them that they turn from their ways and call on the Lord Jesus as well. Repentance from dead works is important because unless we establish that foundation, we won't really have a strong... Uh, drive to reach out to people. You know, if we don't believe they really need to turn. And, and what Satan is deceiving the church into now through a lot of these movements where we see people saying there's no hell and you can be gay Christian. There's a Revoice conference coming up. I think it's going on right now where you know, some of your leading churches are coming together and they're saying that, hey, you know, you don't really have to change. You just need to be celibate. I see you nodding your head. You've been hearing about it too. Huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, revoice. Amen. In other words, repackage the scriptures. Amen. So as to not offend people that, that have same-sex attractions and saying that you don't have to repent to get saved. You can be saved. Just don't practice the lifestyle. No, God wants to deliver the captive. Amen? 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, and we close, and it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another build it thereon. But let every man take heed how he build it thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. No other name given on the heaven whereby men can be saved but the name Jesus. No other way. He's still the way, the truth, and the life in it. So if people don't turn from the world and turn to Jesus, they don't get born again. See, that's a non-compromisable for us in the body of Christ. We can't, you know, we can't back up on that one. Amen? And so it's important that that foundation be settled among us in our lives 
that if you don't repent, if you don't turn, if you're not willing to turn, amen, you know, I often say, you know, the song says, just as I am without one plea, but that that blood will share for me. You can come as you are, but he don't expect you to stay as you is. See, that's what the world is trying to push on the church, that you can come to Jesus, go to Jesus, and go out and do what you were doing first. No, no, no. We come as we are, and then he changes us to conform us to his image. Amen? So foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God non-negotiables, and we in the body of Christ don't need to back up on them. Amen? Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for establishing us in your truth. And God, as we purpose to build our faith, to our trust and reliance on you, we thank you, Lord, for strengthening us, for giving us understanding and revelation even more of who you are. God, as we go into the world around us, Lord, we uh, pray that you would help us, Lord, to strengthen the believers, Lord, who are uh, actually feeling the pressure to compromise in those areas, but also, Lord, that we would boldly stand for truth and reach out to those who need to be saved. Lord, use us, we pray. And God, we give you glory for doing it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.